called G'day T. How's that funky rock tune? I'm oh, enjoying it. Still enjoying it. It'll get old soon, but at the moment, I'm still enjoying it. It will. It, well, it, it will get old soon. But you know what? For 17 bucks, we're the winners. <laughs> we are the winners, yes. <laughs> Indeed. $17. I know. There's we've no stopping us. We've harped on about it, but we love a bargain bin, as we have, have said before. So yeah, I think it was, it was a great bargain. And we own that bit of music. We own it. Actually, we don't. We just own the license. Oh, same shit. I mean, we can use it on anything we want. So That's true. We can use it on anything we want. You know what? I'm going to maybe make it one of those um, novelty car horns. <laughs> drive down the road and just when people piss me off, it'll go. Do, 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 do. I reckon that'll take off. You watch every bogan will have it soon. So it'd be amazing. This week. We are talking about very, very, very heavy subject, aren't we? Sexual we predators. Let's start with one that's, you know, not illegal, unethical, mm. immoral maybe, but certainly not illegal. And that was that guy that you and I both knew in mm. Great Big AOG. And his, let's call him P, yeah. right? And P was, he was a unique kind of cat, wasn't he? And And I think you knew him better than I did. I, I did know him. I certainly did, and I used to hang out with him from time to time. But yep. but I think you you sort of were closer to him. Yeah, he became a really good friend for probably, I don't know how long, I'd, I'd hazard a guess at around a year, um, quite close to him. There was a group of us that used to hang out, but him and I would, would definitely, he would hang out at my place, I'd hang out at his. We'd shoot the breeze. Um, he actually came across... You know, it's a little bit off the wall, but also quite, you know, committed spiritually, um, that he had a relationship with God, that he was trying to do the right thing. I knew he had a past. I knew he'd been a bit of a dick, um, but that's okay. You know, a lot of people had. But for me, you know, he pulled the wool over my eyes. There was, there was no doubt about it. He was living a bit of a, a double or even triple life. There was a lot of stuff going on with him. He was a very complex human being. Um, and it really only started to come out, you know, as I started to hang around with him less, that he was quite a predatory person. For me, when I first came across him, he'd already knocked a girl up in another church. Yep. He had this little son um, who, and, and, and that family had wanted nothing to do with him. Remember, they they really cut him off and didn't want him to see the child. And at the time, I sort of looked at it and went, oh, that's probably because, you know, they're angry at the fact that, you know, their daughter got pregnant. And, it you know, it's very much that sort of power balance where, oh, it's not that she got pregnant, it's that he got her pregnant. Yeah. And, you know, blaming the male, right, because the male has all the power. I don't know, right? I, I just assumed that that's what was going on. And, you know, he would tell us how horrible they were to him and how bad they were to him. But then one day he started telling me some of his sexual exploit stories with her. And he was kind of proud, mm -hmm. to be honest, telling me the the things that he was doing. Like, you know, he was having sex with her while her pastor father was in the next room. And yeah. that was part of the 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 energy or part of the excitement was the fact that they could get busted at any minute kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I certainly um, empathised with him when he used to tell me about, you know, he was blocked from from seeing his son. Um, you know, he wanted to pursue a relationship with his son and even with the girl who he had got pregnant, but it was all blocked. And they were seeing him as um, someone who just couldn't be in their life because he'd knocked up their daughter, he'd had sex with her outside of marriage, don't know whether, you know, she was his first or whatever, um, you know, but really loaded all that up. And I felt for him. I thought, oh, dude, that must be really, really shit. I didn't realise at the time I was just being completely manipulated. He was he was full of it. But I didn't see it. I didn't see it at the time. I was hoodwinked. Yeah, because we were, we were pretty dedicated as people who listened to the podcast would know that we were, we lived it, we walked mm -hmm. it. We, we certainly didn't lead double lives. You know, there were people that did, and I'm not necessarily even condemning that because, you know, as we know now, a lot of that sort of repression and guilt and all that kind of thing was stopping people from being who they really were. Yeah. The problem I had with him, though, and, you know, coming back to our topic of predators, he did seem to be quite predatory towards younger girls 
in the church. And I don't mean younger necessarily as in under 18, although maybe, but I did see him as all about the conquest. You know, he wanted to sort of bang as many of these girls as he could and then tell us about it. Yeah, look, there definitely was some under 18s. There was certainly one girl that comes to mind that I know a couple of the pastors had actually been quite concerned about his relationship with her. He was constantly offering to drive her home and drop her off, make sure she got home safe, of course. But it it came out pretty quickly that it was predatory behaviour and she then started to go missing from... Uh, regularly attending youth groups, church, any of that sort of stuff. Um, And it came out that he was sleeping with her as well, as well as uh, there was another girl there who was completely manipulating. She was very vulnerable. She had a young child as well. And him and a mate were were independently sleeping with her. So, you know, it was very predatory type behaviour. And these people were completely taken advantage of and the power relationship was something was very real definitely uh you could see the effect of it there was no doubt there was a lot of negative effect um and i those two girls that i referred to then in in that story definitely never saw them again anywhere so i think he really drove them away from that support that they could have got from people he had an older brother too who i remember was dating a girl that i'm pretty sure was underage yep she was under 18 and i think he knocked her up didn't he? Or, or did I'm he not, not sure. I, maybe I'm, I'm not across that one. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's interesting because, you know, we, we talked about that in, in the other episode where we talked about sexuality and condoms and protection and all that. Mm. And so a lot of these girls being raised in the church wouldn't dare use any sort of protection. And, and maybe even these guys, too, as much as we're looking at them going, they were duplicitous and two faced, et cetera. Maybe on some level they did have some semblance of faith. And so weren't necessarily using protection. Or maybe it's that, you know, they just, they didn't enjoy protection as, you know, some people don't. And so they didn't care. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, I'm not one to judge someone's faith and whether they did or not. And But they certainly didn't change the fact that their behaviour was predatory and damaging um, and, and certainly was something that was incredibly harmful to those girls that they were manipulating um, for their own means, essentially. P went to Bible college as well for a little while. So he was actually coming along to my Bible college and he used to duck out. It's funny because he used to duck out every break time, disappear to his car for a little while and come back smelling like after a, <laughs> aftershave or deodorant, <laughs> spray on deodorant. So he's obviously going out to the car, having a smoke, right, and then and then coming back. And And funny that because I wouldn't have really cared, right, that mm. he was smoking or not. I totally would have judged him and and – you know, put him down in my mind, but I never would have said a word to him. But he felt, you know, that he needed to to go out and smoke secretly. But even his time in Bible college, you know, it was, I don't know, it, he just wasn't quite there. And I just wonder how much they saw, you know, Bible college and church and these kinds of places as, you know, potent, potential fields from which to harvest, but not in a good way. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And just sort of backtracking slightly on his smoking, he used to smoke really heavily when we used to hang out and I used to judge him. Um, and I used to say, dude, do you want me to pray for you? You know what I mean? That shit can go. You can, let, let me pray for you. So he'd pray. I'd pray for him. And obviously that was a stressful time because he'd had to, to then uh, duck out and have a cigarette straight after the prayer. But <laughs> See, it's interesting that you, he smoked in front of you because he didn't smoke in front of me. So he must have known that my judgment was far larger than yours. I don't know. He, he never smoked in front of me. It was always secretly smoking. Uh, okay. No, he, he you know, I, I, he was reluctant, of course, but he always did. He, there was no problem. But we hung out a lot too. So I think we got reasonably close. I think, um, you know, I, I, for a time, considered him a good mate. Um, and maybe some of that was because he was a little bit on the edge. He wasn't quite part of the conservative fold and maybe you know maybe i saw that as a bit edgy so i'd hang out with him but either way i related to him for a time that's for sure yeah well he was charismatic and he also like you said he'd had a past and and we too had been converted into the fold so we didn't quite connect to that super purity 
you know, we, I, I don't know about you, but well, yeah. actually I do know about you, like me, you connected better to people that seemed more real, had a past, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. But I guess I, I want to ask you, why are they hanging around the church doing this? Uh, look, not, I think, you know, why not nightclubs and, you know, slipping roofies to girls and things? I mean, maybe they did that too, right? But maybe. why the church? The church is full of a wonderful, wonderful mix of people. There's also a high level of vulnerability of people within the church. Generally, people are attracted to church, I think, because there's something they need or there's something that they're trying to fill a void. There's a vulnerability in their life. I mean, it's generalisations here, of course. But I think you see a lot of that and you, you do see a lot of people, both male and female, come in there and they're, they're coming quite open and they come in very trusting. And if someone like this person, who is quite charismatic, who can instill that trust, maybe, you know, maybe that's how he gets to them. Like through that vulnerability, he provides a bit of a bridge and I can I can help you and there he goes. Mm. I think also some of the girls that were, and this is true of the guys as well, right? I don't want to come across as being, you know, extremely sexist towards the younger girls. But I think in this instance anyway, because it was the girls that he was preying on, a lot of those girls were raised in very sheltered environments right so they weren't prepared they weren't they weren't taught you know what to look for and you know how to be aware of this and and you know he would come along with a little bit of naughtiness maybe and the next thing you know he's sleeping with them the next yeah. thing you know they're pregnant and and i was you know reflecting on on this episode and thinking they have no sex education you know some of them will certainly go to school and get a little bit of it but they're told to ignore it yeah. um and also they might even be pulled out and not get it at all but there's also this repression and the other attitude towards sex and even sexual predators which there wasn't a lot of talk of in the 90s it's not like it is now but there was an alarmism yeah. you know like it's like the big bad wolf it's this you know terrible horrible not the guy in the church it's no. It's outside, so they're not they're not ready for it. They're not watching. They're not they're not looking. At least that was how it was in the nineties. Yeah, no, I agree. And look, the, the limited sex education was generally just don't have it till you're married and you'll be fine. Just hold out until you're married. It's within the sanctity of marriage, and then everything is okay there. So it was incredibly limited. You're right. They they had absolutely no idea. And people like this, I think, just thrived in the environment. I mean, how often did we see him? hunting down a girl essentially and like you said it was a th thrill of the chase um he would sleep with them and then move on to the next one so he wasn't alone though there's plenty more plenty more came across in my journey but he was one that definitely stands out hmm. once he told me this story and here we go here's a funny one and we can laugh at him but he told me a story about how he said oh if ever you see a photo of me with some guy's penis in my mouth I want to tell you how this happened. He said, I was really drunk and I fell asleep and they came and they set me up and this guy stuck his dick in my mouth and they took a photo of it, blah, blah. And I remember at the time just sitting there going, uh-huh, whatever you say, man, sure. <laughs> and I was like, why are you telling me this? Like, what, so obviously that he knows that there's this picture out there that he's made some sort of gay porn snapshot or whatever, right? And look, no judgments, right? If that's what you're into, that's what you're into. But it was just hilarious that he was worried that this picture was going to somehow find its way back into people in church. And he was priming me to get ready to dismiss it when I saw it. But I could just remember at the time just going, uh-huh, okay, sure. And in the back of my mind thinking, you totally <laughs> did this. <laughs> Absolutely. And my mind goes to this was in the 90s. It was pre-digital. So somebody in a supermarket somewhere saw that developed and was handing somebody the photos going, here, this one turned out well. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he, he was a bit tragic. He was a bit dangerous. There's no doubt about that. There was other characters at Great Big OG that, that stood out, weren't there? we might not refer to him as the name we call him, but there, there was a guy that had access to a lot of kids. Um, kids were always hanging around him, but no one ever thought of it because it was just like he was in the area of the church that you'd expect that. But later it came out that uh, he had definitely abused children and very much children, underage children, uh, but it was covered up, wasn't it? 
Yeah. Why don't you want to? Why don't you want to name the name that we use for him? Well, I, I guess. Well, I guess again, <laughs> tape guy. Yeah, yeah, we called him Tape Guy because he used to work as a volunteer in the um, in the tape and bookshop at Great Big AOG. Which shows you how long ago it was. It was before DVD. DVD. Yeah, he, otherwise, right. he would have been DVD guy, but no, he was VHS guy. Yeah, VHS guy and also tape. Well, when I think about tape, I think about the cassettes because you used to be able to get the um, sermons from him as well. Yes, yeah, you could. But you could get them on video at Great right. Big AOG too. So he was connected to the sort of creative ministry side of the church. I remember he would often, a tape guy would be in the tape stall, but also he would sometimes be involved in the recording or, um, you know, the, the video editing and those kinds of things as well. I can remember he had a young boy that was that he was sort of hanging around and mentoring. And this, this boy would have probably been about 10. I reckon tape guy would have been, late 30s maybe even maybe even as much as 50s right and this yeah. kid was about 10 and i remember he was barking orders at, at this kid one day you know you stop this you blah, blah. and and i looked over at him he said oh i have a relationship with such and such as mum and an agreement and she lets me look after this little boy um so i'm i'm sort of like a father to him and i was like oh oh okay fair enough and then later as you said it sort of came out that this guy was actually facing criminal charges yeah. for sexual abuse, and he had basically embedded himself in the church. What appeared to me at the time to be a move or an act to appease the courts, to appear like he was. So he wasn't in the church before this all happened. Then he got, you know, up on charges. So all of a sudden he's joining the church and he's very involved in the church and he's the tape guy and, you know, all this kind of thing. And I, Remember that one day he just sort of disappeared. So I wonder if his court case came, he got what he wanted from the church, he moved on, or if they actually got rid of him, you know, that the church actually shunted him out. But there was never any conversation with any of us like, this guy's on sexual abuse, you know, of minors charges. He's hanging out with this young boy in the church. No, nothing was said to us. And even as leaders, you know, sort of middle leaders, nothing was said to us. No, nothing. It was a very good cover up as such, because to this day, I've got no idea. Um, certainly, there was a lot of questions asked back then. And I, I'm not even sure who knew who was privy to it. You would hear some snide comments, but never anything factual, never anything about that, that could let you determine what happened next. So which is frightening, too, because it shows how embedded it can be, how it can be covered up. And then you don't have the opportunity for people to learn from what has happened, to look out for the signs, to look out for those danger points that that come up, and I think that is something much like the 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 sexual education of young people. They they miss out on that because it's taboo. They don't want to talk about it. But the same thing happens with mm -hmm. child sex abuse when it comes up. It's mm -hmm. not spoken about. It's covered up. So all of a sudden, it happens again and again and again because there's nothing called out. Mm. And remembering too, this is the 90s. So even in mainstream society, it wasn't like it is now. No. Right. But but that being said, it concerned me that he was, you know, hanging around this this boy. And when it when it was revealed later on that he was up on, you know, sexual abuse charges and this is why he was in the church, etc. Even then, even the 90s and even me in my 20s, B, I was like, so why is he hanging around that kid? And why mm. is nobody watching him hang around that kid? Yeah. Well, you know, why is nobody talking to us and saying? Yeah, you know why? Because someone would have prayed for him or a bunch of people would have prayed for him or he would have been to a deliverance meeting and it was no longer a problem. And how many times did we see that over and over and over? I just prayed for him. That'd be fine. No worries. Then we can move on. Do you know when alarm bells went off? You remember, B, I looked quite young. Right. When yeah. I was in my 20s, I could have definitely been mistaken for a teenager. It was just I just looked young. Yeah. And um, you, you now still that I'm, do. I, I yeah, that's right. Now that I'm 50, it's a curse mm -hmm. to look this young. But I, I can remember one day I was in shorts and I was in a cut off singlet um, and it was you know, summertime. and It was the end of um, end of the youth service. And this tape guy came up to me. And he was shaking. He was tr literally trembling. And he just kept touching me. 
kept touching my arm and put, trying to put his arm around me and talk to me and everything. And I remember at the time just thinking, whoa, dude, this is so like icky and gross. And, you know, and I had no idea that he was a pedophile, that he was actually vibing at me because I looked young. I thought he was mm. just gay and it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't what I was into. It certainly wasn't into him either, but it was yeah. really, really creepy. And then later, of course, when it all came out, it was like, ah, okay, I see. It's because I looked like I was 17. Disturbing, isn't it? It is completely frightening. Big, big ticket items, though. Let's move on to the big ticket items. Everyone that, it, everyone within our, certainly within our Facebook group, you know, this has buzzed before. There's one name you call out and when you talk about sexual abuse in the church, and that is Frank Houston the father of Brian Houston. A lot has happened around that. A lot has come out. This is on public record, um, so we are not saying anything out of turn, but he admitted to child sex abuse over many years in New mm. Zealand. Yeah, that's right. Now, I was I was overseas when a lot of this broke, so I missed a lot of it. Yeah. So I, I certainly caught up on a, a little bit of it later. And there are people in our Facebook group and there are other websites and, and podcasts and those kinds of things that are much more across this. So we don't pretend that this is going to be some sort of expose on these guys, um, but it's, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a chat about them. But yeah. what was interesting was the Royal Commission to Sexual Abuse of Children censured Brian Houston mm. because when his father admitted to this and admitted it to Brian and admitted it to the New South Wales executive of the Assemblies of God, or then they might have been the Australian Christian churches by then. They covered it up. Yeah. But, and when was it? This was like 1999, 2000 or something, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. But it was in 2015 that the the commission actually censured him. Yeah. And this is Brian Houston. And there was a couple of things that went on. First of all, they had a duty to report this to the police and they didn't and the second thing was what sort of an organization would put the son of the person who's accused of this in charge of the investigation because at then at that stage brian was the head of the assemblies of god mm -hmm. and he managed the whole thing yeah which was just stupid because it's his it's his own father you know so what sort of an organization would do that so he got censured officially by the inquiry. the inquiry. Yeah. Yeah, massive, massive conflict of interest and cover up. And, um, you know, Brian chose not to um, not to expose it. And well, I think there was a bit of a sweetheart deal done that, you know, Frank would step down from senior ministry and basically slink off to the side. I mean, that, that I, I, I can imagine what had gone through Brian's head as, as the son was, um, this happened 25 years ago. So I think the allegations from what went from the 1940s, late 40s through the 70s or something like that, late 70s. And it would have been like, well, it's happened, it's gone. I'm sure dad's repented. Let's move on. I don't know. I'm speculating. Um, but still chose not to to report it and uh, and do something about it. More recently, though, we've seen that, that Brian has been charged with uh, withholding this information. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. And, and it makes me wonder why it took so long. You know, like they were building a case, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah, look, it's interesting. I, I don't know what will happen from here. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what repercussions there are. But we've seen statements come out from Hillsong um, on behalf of Brian. I don't think we've actually seen a statement from Brian. He may have, but I haven't seen anything. It's definitely been from the organisation. The thing that struck me with it all is why just him? Like, I realise he was the leader, but surely there was a group of men, a group of leaders from the then AOG or ACC around him that made this decision as a group. But but maybe not. Maybe that's why they've only charged him. Did Were there people that did not know within the, the upper echelons of the AOG or did they all know? That's what I want to know. You know, how much of it is a group decision? How much of it was a an Australian Christian Church's AOG decision, how much of it was just him. And it's interesting that they've only charged him. Or are there other charges coming against other people later on? I don't know. Yeah, it'll, it'll certainly be interesting to, to see because I think um, it'll be October or something. I think the hearing date is set and no doubt that will be adjourned as they, they seek 
further time to, to gather evidence, but it should come out, I'd imagine, who was involved in that decision-making process or what appears to be, um, you know, sweeping this under the carpet. So it is good that accountability is coming, though, and this isn't, for me, it's not about Brian Houston being accountable or Hillsong. It's accountability to anyone who covers up this sort of information. I mean, there's lives uh, that are damaged by this, and it's just horrible. So it's great to see some accountability. Do you have any idea of what's the worst that can happen for him? Like, what's the maximum charge? I really don't know, but I, I would imagine, I mean, child sex abuse is something that there's certainly the um, legal repercussions, uh, something that have stepped up over the last few years with the Royal Commissions and such. So it could carry some sort of jail time. I'd imagine that it won't happen. There won't be jail time. But uh, I'd imagine that jail time is could be something the worst that could happen. But these are historical charges as well, right? They, they're not going to bring modern laws back to then. Won't, don't they have to actually interpret this through the laws that existed at the time? I don't know what happened with George Powell, but remember when George Powell was jailed and they were for very historical cases, he still got jail time. So I, I'm not sure that they actually have to have a look at them through the eyes of back then. I'm, I'm actually not sure. I mean, there's legal experts out there that um, certainly got him off and on technicalities, and that may be some of the technicality. I'm not sure. Well, the difference with Powell was Powell was actually charged with sexually abusing children which would have been a crime then yeah. whereas with what with the cover-up and everything i don't know what the law actually involved obviously whatever the whatever the law is and whatever the 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 point is the cops wouldn't have brought charges against him that wouldn't stick and that you know wouldn't possibly fly in court so obviously there is something that can be done yeah most certainly look it'll be interesting to see what happens? I mean, look, best case scenario, others are on notice and they recognise that they can't cover this up, that it's something that they have to take seriously and they have to weed it out of their organisations and be more vigilant. Yeah, interesting. Well, we'll see what happens, eh? Mm. Well, what made it really interesting, though, is that the New Zealand Assemblies of God basically had three, three chairmen or three heads of the New Zealand Assemblies of God who, in a row, were all accused of sexual inappropriateness towards minors, right, or sexual abuse towards minors, three of them. So um, I'm going to read a little bit of an article, and I will share this link, right? And, and I know that people in our Facebook um, group are going to have a lot more to say about this than we do. But I want to read an article, which is a 2020 article, uh, 11th of July 2020, from the New Zealand Herald. And I just want to read a little bit of it because I think it's really important to note that this is not just Frank Houston. This is the guy before him and the guy after him kind of thing. So um, leaders of the New Zealand church agreed to keep details from their congregations about a prominent pastor's sexual abuse of children. It has emerged as the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care prepares to target clergy. So this is the New Zealand Royal Commission, right? Yeah. A special herald, being the New Zealand Herald, investigation has uncovered fresh allegations. So this isn't the historical ac ac uh, accusations that we've been talking about. Fresh allegations and evidence of child abuse perpetrated by two leaders of the Assemblies of God both uh, before both abusers left New Zealand to continue their ministries in Australia. Meanwhile, the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care has confirmed to the Herald that it considers its terms of reference to include pastoral care, significantly broadening its investigation into the actions of churches. So basically, you've got Frank Houston, OK, being being the one that we're talking about. But there's another guy by the name of Jim Williams. And Jim Williams was a pastor originally started off in New Zealand and then came over to Australia um, mm -hmm. later on. And he was the pastor of Garden City AOG, which was one of the big AOG mega churches, right? So um, I'm going to share this link, but it's saying that Jim Williams, former leader of the AOG in New Zealand, sexually assaulted at least two girls in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Pretty full on. Oh, it, it's very full on. And, and, and it says that, you know, Houston and Williams were both general superintendents and then left for Australia. Both are now dead. But interestingly, it finishes like this. Williams was replaced as general superintendent in 1989 by Pastor Wayne Hughes, who resigned in 2005 on health grounds after an allegation of sexually inappropriate behaviour with a teenager. So that one is just an allegation. I want to sort of point that out. But basically, you've got three in a row. Yeah. 
within the New Zealand AOG. It's frightening. It's really embedded sort of behaviour, isn't it? It is. And, you know, we want to sort of say, oh, it's all the Catholic priests. It's, you know, it's the Catholic priests and altar boys, etc. And meanwhile, this is this is what's going on in the AOG's backyard. Yeah, look at 100%. And, and I mean, I, I guess I also want to point out that it's not, this doesn't just happen within churches. I mean, there's a broad range of places that pedophiles do use as a platform to get to children. And I have alluded before that I work in a sector, um, a human services type sector, and, and I am privy to allegations of where children are in care and workers with qualifications get into these places where children are in care and abuse them as workers, as trusted people. And I think that's the definitely a theme is it's always somebody who can instill trust. Obviously, there's the grooming process to, you know, get the kids to, to instill trust, but it's across a range of things, not just religious institutions. I mean, we've seen it with the Scouts, which did have a basis in the, uh, as a religious institution, but it's in lots and lots of areas where people make efforts to actually get to a place where they can actually um, abuse children, unfortunately. Mm. Well, the the interesting thing as well about the Royal Commission was there was a number of cases that they actually brought out. There was some in Victoria, some in Queensland, some in New South Wales, etc. And of course, you know, the Frank Houston one was a big one. I remember when I first heard about this, two things stuck out to me. The first was that a friend of mine, she was a pastor's daughter, and her parents had come from New Zealand, and they had actually attended Frank Houston's Bible College. Uh -huh. And I can remember my friend saying, at the time, saying, yeah, Frank Houston, he's got a real ministry to young men. He's got a real ministry to young men, because whenever he came to our house, because, you know, the parents were living in mm. Australia, and they knew him from their Bible college, and so they would entertain him whenever he would come to town. He was very interested in my brother, always interested in my brother and, you know, trying to minister to my brother and everything. And I can remember hearing that story going, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's interesting. That's, you know, young, he's going to minister to young men, blah, blah. And then when it broke, I just went, oh, oh, okay. oh okay. And he used to stay the night. Yeah, right? okay. So so God God knows what happened there, and I'm not I'm not making any... Um, accusations there, but, you know, hopefully nothing. But the other story that spoke to me was, again, it was, you know, remember I looked young, yes. right? But there was a time when Frank Houston came to visit us at Great Big AOG, came to speak, and he was there for a whole weekend. He did the youth, he did, you know, two services on Sunday, etc. And I can remember at the end of the youth service, Frank Houston comes walking past. And as he did, he looked down at me and he stopped and he reached his hand out and he grabbed my hand and he squeezed my hand, right, as he walked past. And I can remember at the time thinking, oh, man of God, mm -hmm. you know, oh, man of God reaching, you know, grabbing me, you know, passing the anointing, whatever, da, da, da. And then when it broke, I went, ah, oh, tape guy. Yeah. Now, look, mm -hmm. you could say you don't go outside because, you know, the tickets you haven't on yourself are going to blow off. But, you know, you can feel it at the time. And, um, yeah, it was creepy. And then when it, when this all broke, I was like, fucking Frank Houston, you mm. know, like just just so wrong, so wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it, it has been great the last few years, um, both with, within Australia and New Zealand, and I'm sure other places around the world, that there has been huge efforts by government to hold royal commissions and inquiries into this t to expose it. And it hasn't been just church focused. I mean, that's been a component. It's been a, many institutions within Australia and institutions, including churches. Um, so I think there has been some efforts to really to out that um, and to call out the behaviour and to add a level of accountability. What the frightening thing is, is churches should be really putting those levels of accountability themselves if they really care for the people that is that are within their flock that they're looking after then those levels of accountability should be put in there by by the ministers by the pastors by the leadership broader leadership but it appears that there's been a huge gap there well you know b when we used to look across at what was happening with the catholic church right and all this sort of 
you know, the Catholic brothers and the Catholic priests and all that sort of abuse. And, you know, for what it's worth, my, my year, nine, I went to a Catholic school and yeah. my year nine RE teacher is a Catholic brother and is now in jail for mm. all this kind of stuff. And and again, I, I can happily say that I was, you know, not not touched by him, which was good, but I'm sure some of my peers were. But the thing about that is the reason why the Catholics didn't do anything about it is because they think that they are God's chosen, right? Yeah. That they are God's chosen community. And so it doesn't happen in here. Sure, it happens out there. So when we're in the AOG or we're in Pentecostalism, we were looking at, because I was still in when all this sort of Catholic stuff broke, and looking out and going, well, that just shows they're not God's community. That yeah. just shows that, you know, they're they're whatever. And yet we as the AOG, that doesn't happen in here because we are, in fact, God's chosen. And I think that's part of the blindness is yeah. that people genuinely believe that they're anointed by God, that the Holy Spirit is there, that that sort of thing. You know, I mean, God's giving people words all the time. Right? Mm. Was anyone giving people words and saying Frank Houston's playing with children yeah. or that Jim Williams is, you know, raping girls in the 60s? Mm-hmm. Was anybody getting words about that? And so because they weren't, they're all thinking it's all good here. You know, it's good in Pentecostalism. And the Baptists might be thinking, oh, yeah, poor Pentecostals, lucky it's not happening in the Baptist church. And the Anglicans are saying, but it's happening everywhere. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's a real problem. And, and it's frightening, I guess, just how much it has infiltrated these different groups and particularly, you know, the church and the church were we were both involved with um, and, you know, the many other churches that these accusations have been proven. Um, not They're not just allegations or accusations. There's a lot of proof around this as well. So frightening stuff, T. But again, coming back to the organisation, now we're not in there anymore, so we can't say what protections have been put in place. So it would be really nice for people in the Facebook group that are maybe still involved with Pentecostal churches, you know, whether it's AOG, CRC, COC, it would be really nice to hear from from you about what things have been put in place. Now, obviously, there are legal precautions that have been taken that the government expect of them to have things like working with children's check if you're going to be working in the Sunday school, etc. But I'd really like to hear from people what has changed. And God help us, that certainly things must have changed, B. Oh, I have to surely i mean things like working with children's checks i mean there certainly has been some issues with them that some people have accessed them in a way that they've been counterfeit um that that was uncovered i remember in queensland uh, there was thousands of them that were all counterfeited so you've got to worry when people are trying to access working with children's checks that uh, aren't theirs so i'm sure that stuff there's is rife but i'm also sure that some of those measures certainly help i would love to hear that also and i'm i'm skeptical i'm just like has anything changed i don't know i would hope it has but i would hope that also that they're a lot more open in talking about it in putting it out there and raising the consciousness of parents because i think a lot of parents are quite naive too it's a trusting environment but also kids like educate them and there is a reluctance to educate them there's you always heard oh they're too young to talk about that or whatever but there was always an excuse not to talk to kids about this stuff that was seen as adult content essentially so i i'm reluctant to to think that anything's changed i want to be proven wrong i think the other thing about it all is underneath all this is this sexual repression right so it's not just about the kids are too young. It's also the fact that within Pentecostalism, no one wants to talk about sex. No. You know, so let alone, you know, what we would call, you know, sexual abuse. I can remember talking once to one of the pastors from another AOG, let's call it suburban AOG, and he was kind of a friend of mine, maybe not quite a friend of mine, but I was a young and -and up-and-coming pastor and he was a pastor, so we'd spend a bit of time talking and I'd seen Reality Bites. Do you remember that movie, Reality Bites? Well, no, yeah, no, what no, a no. great soundtrack. Yeah. What a great yeah. soundtrack. That was the soundtrack of my leaving Pentecostalism, to be honest. Yeah. But I'd seen this movie, and the thing about it was I resonated with it, and it spoke to me so much. And it was kind of scary at the time going, why is this secular, non-Christian movie really speaking to me? And and the soundtrack was amazing. And But one of the scenes in it is they go and get AIDS tests. Yeah. Right. One of the girls gets an AIDS test and she's freaking out about it. And 
you know, I hadn't always been born again. So I had actually been through that sort of process. I actually went and got an AIDS test and freaked out for a couple of days waiting for the results. But I remember talking to the pastor and saying, who's telling these kids? So I remember he turned to me and said, oh, you're a bit left of center, aren't you? And I was like, well, no, I don't think so. You know, who's telling these kids about things like AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases? And, you know, how are they going to find out if, if we don't tell them? Don't we have a responsibility within Christ, within God, within the boundaries of our belief system, etc.? Don't we have a place to educate them? And the answer was no, no, we don't. And, you know, it wasn't just the whole sexuality thing that was going on in, in Reality Bites. There was a whole lot of other things that were really speaking to me. That, that was one of the things. I went back to the AOG and said, hey, let's do this. And they were like, no, let's not. And I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah. Because do you think it, it's for them, it just opens up a can of worms, which they can't control because they don't have answers for. I think it would be a scary place for them to open that up. You know, a lot of them wouldn't know the answers themselves. No. You know, like let alone to to create a, you know, a Christian program for kids around sexually transmitted diseases when they mm. don't know themselves. You know, a lot of them have been raised in the church or come in quite young and, you know, yeah. but I mean, it's not hard to find out, right? No, but I, I think, well, particularly now with old Dr. Google, but I think, um, you know, the answer to everything is, well, that's not going to be an issue as long as you don't have sex before marriage. That's that's what everything seemed to be uh, centred around, around sexual education. So you don't have to worry about STIs if you're not sleeping together before marriage and you both haven't. How are you going to bring that? You're not going to catch it off the toilet seat. I mean, you could. Yeah, it was it was purity culture is the, is the term that I've heard given to this. It was all about purity culture. So it's just don't do it. The end. So, you know, and we had this conversation about the condom, right? You know, the condom that fell out of your friend's wallet. Yeah, I, I look back now and think your friend was a fucking star. That's yeah. exactly what he should be doing. He should be carrying a condom, right? I'm not suggesting that he should, as a Christian, always be using it. But if you do, better that than, you know, knocking some girl up. Yeah, 100%. And if you're in the revival center, you then have to marry them. Oh, you'd have to marry them. Yeah, that'd be. That'd be shocking. There was there was a couple of times, you know, that I I think I've I've mentioned where I got pretty close, and um, if the church had found out, I would have been forced to marry. Glad that never happened. Yeah. Glad I dodged that bullet. But you know, we've talked about sexual abuse of children, um, you know, with with Tape Guy and Frank Houston and, and etc. But remembering the other thing is with this whole sort of sexual predator thing, it can happen between two consenting adults, mm. and or at least, you know, one adult appearing to consent but actually being manipulated you know that there can certainly be sexual sexually predatory behavior towards adults and that's what we saw at least in part with our friend p he was yeah. on the one hand yeah there were some young young girls that he was hitting on but there were some older girls as well oh yeah totally and again it was that vulnerability and you know everyone wants to be loved everyone wants someone to love them and i think <laughs> With, within Great Big AOG in particular, we've, we've spoken about this before too, it was a very inbred environment. You'd only generally date someone from within the congregation. So if somebody showed interest in you, well, you know, lap that up. And if this guy was manipulative and he was, um, you know, displaying some of those behaviours we spoke about before, then of course it was easy for him to manipulate people, wasn't it? Mm. And, you, and you don't want to be 18 and left on the shelf. No, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's it's true. You know, back then everyone to try and get married quite early. Yeah, not good. Well, look, I would like to open this up, as I said before, into the into the Facebook group. I'd love to hear people's opinions on this. I'm sure people have got a lot more information around this. We have to be very careful, though, in the Facebook group not to jump into allegations that haven't been proven, etc. But stuff that's on the public record, let's let's open it up. Let's talk about it. Because I know while some of us were were around when all this happened, others have come in sort of later on. And this may be some some news or some revelation to you. Next week, B, we're gonna bring in Fiona Newton. Mm -hmm. You know who she is? The Hillsong in schools lady. That's exactly her. Yeah. So she's gonna come in and tell us all about the campaign that she ran. She's a former teenage fundamentalist herself she was in the revival centers she was also in the aog and she may have been in some other groups as well but we'll we'll ask her about that and hear from her but she got a bit concerned about hillsong with their programs being in schools 
and so she started a bit of a campaign. It went national. It made some some noise. So I'd really like to hear about that from her. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, and we don't want to make it sound like we're picking on the Hill songs. We've brought them up. It's um, it's relevant. It's stuff that I think um is really good to talk about. We're keen to to pick Fiona's brain around why she saw it as important to challenge this. So look forward to speaking more about that. Yeah, it might be interesting as some people listen, they may not agree with Fiona. And look, you, you obviously at times probably don't agree with us. Mm. You know, when we bring these guests on, just because we bring them on doesn't mean that we're necessarily in agreement with them or disagreement with them, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to say it out loud. I, I do totally agree with Fiona mm -hmm. and what she's doing because I was recruited through schools. So in that sense, you know, I'm nailing my colours to the mast. But we want to bring people in that have different stories. You know, some yep. people are going to end up in different places. So it's certainly not just bringing in people that have landed where we want them to land. Um, and so you're going to hear from from different people with different opinions and maybe opinions that are sort of contrary to yours. But that doesn't mean that they're not valid or that they don't have a valid voice. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. That's important. It's important for... Um... Yeah, not everyone just needs to hear our opinions. How boring would that be? We've got to spice it up a bit. So, you know, it, we know that stuff might have been brought up for people tonight. So if you or someone you know has been affected by sexual abuse, there will be some links in the show notes that people can have a look at and access some help to help them work through it. All right, mate. So as I said, next week, Fiona Newton. I'm a bit excited about that one. Mm. How about we cue the music? Cue the fuck out of the music now. I'll see you next week, Pete. Catch you then. Bye.